temptation is a fact of life. We are going to be tempted. It's not a matter of if we're tempted, it's when we're tempted. We do overcome things as we grow in God and things that used to be a real temptation to me are not a temptation at all anymore. But then there are always new things that God's showing us that he wants us to deal with. We have trials in our life. We have tribulations. And it's during those times that we're usually tempted to do things that we should not do. It's much easier to behave when everything's going your way. But we all know that that's not normal life. That's not the way things normally happen. So we have to learn how to go through trials and yet remain the same, act the same as we would if we were in a good time. I believe that should be the goal of every Christian, to become so stable. The world needs to see stability. When I grew up, I never was around stable people. My father was explosive and my mother would cave in because of fear. When I married Dave, he was so stable and his stability reached out to me and said, I want that. I want that stability. I want that maturity that he has. Now, it took a long time, and I had to go through a lot, but his example to me was very important in my life. And I remember with Dave that no matter how I behaved, he didn't let it change him. I could get mad, and he'd stay happy. I could sit around and feel sorry for myself all day. He'd play with the kids. And it used to make me mad because I thought, here I am miserable and you're just having a good time. But I realized that it was one of the best things that he ever did for me. Because he didn't need to feed my problem. That doesn't mean he didn't need to have any compassion, which he had that when he needed to. But I said last night, the only way that we can kill something or remove the power from something in our life is by not feeding it anymore. So. If we have an issue, every time we give in to that, then we feed it and we have to spend one more night in the wilderness and take one more trip around the same stupid mountain that we've been going around over and over and over again. So temptation is a fact of life. Jesus never told us anywhere. The apostle Paul, the other apostles in their writings never told us anywhere to pray that we would not be tempted. So you might as well just stop praying Oh, no, God, not this. When that happens, you know, I'm always tempted. Don't pray not to be tempted, but pray. And this is a very important part of this. Pray, as Jesus instructed us to, that when you're tempted, you will not come into the temptation. That when you're tempted, you won't cave in. I believe that we should be the kind of people that literally, through Christ, not on our own, but through Him, can stand up to anything and come out victorious on the other side. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. And a lot of times when we're in trials and tribulations, we just think, well, that's a time to just sit around and feel sorry for ourselves and stop growing and don't keep our commitments anymore. But that's the last thing in the world you want to do. When you're hurting, you need to behave exactly as you would when you were not hurting. We need to keep doing what we know is right, no matter how we feel. Let's look at Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. I had that in one of my other messages, but didn't get around to it. And the Lord's reminding me of it right now. And I just want to share this scripture with you because I think it's very important. Though the fig tree does not blossom, and there's no fruit on the vine, though the product of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls. Now, it sounds to me like he's having a bad day. <laughs> if it would have been Israel yesterday, if you weren't here last night, you're not aware that he had such a terrible, terrible time trying to get here. And we had lunch with him today and he told us the details of it. And it was really quite amazing that that many goofy things could happen to one guy <laughs> in one day. And for him, you know, it might have been missed my airplane, left my home plenty of time, got caught in traffic, got to the airport late, slow at the ticket counter, got to security, 
slow at security, only one person working, took forever. Got to the ticket counter, they said, well, your luggage made it on, or got to the run thing there where the plane is. Your luggage got on, but sorry, we just closed the door, you're not getting on. <laughs> they rerouted him to Newark, but his luggage went to Philadelphia. <laughs> Finally got there, started for here, hit a major traffic jam again, something wrong on the highway, sat there for like 25 minutes, on and on and on. Got 25 minutes away from here, 20 minutes away, he thought, this is cool, I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna have 20 minutes left. Got pulled over by a policeman and got three tickets. <laughs> and the policeman was a young guy that thought a little more highly of himself than he should have, and he was giving him a rough time. He's like, Get your hands up where I can see them. Keep those hands up where I can see them. <laughs> Just really being mean to him. And Israel said, it took everything that he could do. <laughs> he said, if I wouldn't have been going to a Joyce Meyer conference to lead worship, <laughs> it might have been a different story. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> Not easy, but doable. Everything that God tells us to do, we can do it. And it's for our benefit. It's for our benefit. You know, he, when he managed to not get upset and talk back to that policeman, it was a great witness to that policeman. Maybe not. He didn't maybe even know that he was a Christian, but who knows? Maybe sometime he'll see him on television. Oh, that's that guy I pulled over. <laughs> but I'll tell you who it helped that he didn't get upset. It helped him. It helped him. Because he won a great victory. And every time that you can get through a difficult situation, and keep your cool, behave the way you believe Jesus would want you to behave, you have gained a great victory. And you know what else? The next time you go through something like that, it will be easier than it was the last time. And if you pass that test, the next time it will be easier than it was that time. And pretty soon, the devil will not even be able to bother you with that thing anymore. Why? Because you're dead to it. You've died to that thing. Let's look at verse 19 now. The Lord God is my strength. In these situations, the Lord God is my strength, my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet and will make me to walk, not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, and responsibility. And it was written for the chief musician with stringed instruments. <laughs> I love that. He calls our high places trouble, suffering, and responsibility. We think high places are on the mountaintop floating around singing the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. We can go through temptations and remain stable. Don't pray for them not to come. Pray that when they come, you won't cave in. Now, there is definitely a war for man's soul. And we need to understand the difference between our spirit, our soul, and our body. We understand the body pretty well. We look at it all the time in the mirror. We dress it. We feed it. When it doesn't feel good, we lay it down. But we don't understand as much about the soul. And we probably even understand very little about the spirit, but maybe even the spirit we understand even more than the soul. The spirit is the deepest part of your being. You have a spirit, a human spirit. And if you're not born again, then your human spirit is disconnected from the spirit of God. God is a spirit and he communicates with us spiritually. So if you're not alive to God, are not full of God, then you're going to miss everything that God wants to say to you in your life. When a person receives Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of them, and once again, they become alive to God. 
One of the things that happens when you become alive to God is you begin to hear from God. And it's not necessarily words that you hear, but you begin to sense things spiritually. I call it a, a holy knowing. There's just a knowing that you shouldn't do that or you should do that. Well then, it's our job to yield to what we're sensing in our spirit. However, at the same time, Satan, because he wants to keep us from growing, he will be pressuring us, not through our spirit because he can't get in there, but he'll be coming at us from outside, trying to use our soul, which is the second layer of our being, and your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. So he'll come through the outside trying to get into our soul and then back out through our body. So his ugliness and his trash and his meanness comes out through us. God, on the other hand, is in us, and he's trying to work from the inside to work through our soul and out through our body with his goodness and his mercy and his grace and his love and his stability. So we're in quite a war, and it goes on pretty much all day long in different ways. How many of you sense that sometimes, that you just feel like you're in a war? And the Bible says that. Actually, in 2 Corinthians 10, it's, it teaches us that we have a war going on in our mind. And I believe that the mind is like, although the mind is part of the soul, because your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, I believe that, your, that our mind is kind of like the major doorway to the soul. If we don't do something about our thinking, then we're never going to get our life straightened out. And so if we could look at 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they're mighty before God to the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. A stronghold is an area where an enemy digs in and builds a camp and attacks from that place. Well, Satan loves to build strongholds in our minds. And he doesn't really mind how long he takes to do it. He'll work on you for years and years and years. When I was abused as a child, I heard lies and lies. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never get over this. You'll always have a second-rate life. You're never going to really be able to love properly. If people knew about this, they would hate you. They would despise you. They would blame you. And so I lived according to what I believed. But when Christ came into my life, I began to learn the Word, and my mind began to be renewed. The dark places in my mind had light brought into them, and I began to learn how to think according to the Word of God, rather than thinking according to the lies of Satan. We have weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And the main weapon that we have is the Word of God used in different ways to defeat the devil. Jesus was tempted. We're talking about temptation. And Jesus was tempted, it's recorded in Luke 4, when he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Every wilderness that you end up in is not just something that's totally demonically induced. God actually led him into that place to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. Why in the world would he do that? Well, I think sometimes we have to go through things to realize what God can really do through us if we'll let him do it. And Jesus was tempted in several different ways, but he passed every test. And every time Satan would lie to him, he would say, it is written. And he'd quote the word, and that would defeat Satan. It is written. And he would quote the word, and it would defeat Satan. And we need to learn how to talk out loud to the devil. You need to learn how to use the word that you have as a weapon. Singing songs like we sang tonight is a weapon because they're full of the word of God. One of the greatest ways to do spiritual warfare is to sing, 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 sing. Let's look at the next verse, verse 5. Inasmuch as we refute arguments, theories, reasonings, and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought captive under the obedience of Jesus Christ. So he's saying that you can't just think everything that falls in your head. Some of those thoughts you have to cast down. You have to pitch them out. You have to throw them away. And if you don't do that, 
you're in for big trouble because if Satan can get into your mind he can get into your emotions he can get into your will and then he's gonna work through your body to hurt other people and to be a poor witness for Christ and I think one of the worst things that can happen is when we have our car plastered with bumper stickers and we've got all this Christian jewelry hanging all over us and all of our neighbors know that we go to the something we call church every week and that we're Christians but they don't know what in the world that is because we don't appear to them to be one bit different than anybody else that they know and it's not even that we're it's not even that people are mean it's not even that they don't want to do what's right people need to be taught how to understand themselves and to realize that you are a tripart being there's a lot more to you than what you see when you look in the mirror you have a body but all that body is is a vehicle for you to get around in in this earth and the thing is is the devil's a spirit and God is a spirit and they both want to use you because they can't function here without finding a body that they can work through so God wants to fill you so you become as Paul said a body wholly filled with God himself I love that in Ephesians 3 that we might become a body wholly filled with God himself but then Satan also wants to use you to do his dirty work how many of you know that many times the attacks that you come under and the temptations that you have come through other people but it's the enemy working through them to hurt you and so if he can manage to work through us to hurt people or work through them to hurt us then he's had a good day the point is that I want to make tonight who are you going to give into which temptation are you going to take see when we talk about temptation we always talk about being tempted to do bad things but tonight I want to bring to you how often God tempts you to do right things and how often God tempts you to do good things and I think that many of us are much better at resisting God than we are resisting the devil I remember one time when I saw a watch that I liked and I have a habit sometimes if I see something I really 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 like and especially if it's a good price I'm likely to buy more than one and I bought three watches exactly alike I must have really liked them I think they're about twenty dollars a piece so I was wearing one I had two in, in boxes at home and I was talking to someone who admired my watch and all of a sudden I was tempted to give it away and I must say that I successfully resisted that temptation and kept my watch <laughs> now you can laugh at me but how many of you have done the exact same thing there were people tonight that resisted the temptation to put twenty dollars in the offering and instead you put in two there were people who resisted the temptation to become a new partner with us there were people who resisted the temptation to put in a hundred dollars and you put in five let me tell you something we are tempted to do good all the time but we are way too good at resisting it yeah wow 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 and I think by the time we're done tonight hopefully and prayerfully we're gonna be ready to be to walk out of here and say okay God I am ready to give in to every temptation you give me every temptation that you give me I'm gonna give into it see the Bible says submit yourself to God James 4 7 submit yourself to God resist the devil and he will flee and I really believe that just in submitting ourselves to God we automatically resist the devil empty space is a place if he comes and finds our mind empty then he's gonna fill it with garbage but if we keep our mind full of the Word of God and thoughts and plans about how we can be a blessing to somebody else then the devil comes and he finds no space available sign hanging on your mind no space available busy doing good things <laughs> amen no space available busy doing good things do not be conformed to this world this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed changed entirely by the entire renewal of your 
mind. So we see that the mind is kind of like the battlefield. I originally taught that series about 20 to 22 years ago. About seven years after that, 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Battlefield of the Mind that still to this day is our number one best-selling book. Why? Because people recognize that there is a battle in their minds. And that's where we have to win the war. It's in our thinking. And we spend way too much time thinking about everything that's wrong with us and not enough time thinking about the new creature that we are in Christ and what God has enabled us to do. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. But I say walk and live habitually, habitually. I love the way the Amplified Bible puts this. Walk and live habitually. You got to form new habits in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to live in the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Being responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. If you're tempted to give your watch away, you don't fight that temptation, you give it away. Now, another time I had a bracelet that I bought that I really liked. And it was quite an attractive bracelet, not extremely expensive, but quite attractive. I think I made, paid maybe $59 for it. And I was in a restaurant one day where I'd never eaten before. Went through this little line. It was a deli type place, got my sandwich. The man said, where did you get that bracelet? And I said, well, I, I shop at a little place, told him where it was at. And he said, man, my wife would love that bracelet. Well, I was tempted to give it to him. So I took it right off and I said, here, you just take this home and give it to your wife. Now, that time I was not able to resist God. God was strong enough in me that day that I just simply could not resist obeying him and letting him use me for something good. Well, I wasn't trying to impress everybody, but let me tell you, everybody in the line was very impressed. Oh my gosh, well, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, well, what about when they're flipping through their TV and then they see me? That's that lady that, well, my goodness, she actually lives what she preaches. Come on now, is anybody understanding what I'm saying? You see, talk with no walk is useless. Well, James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's so good to know that through Christ, we have power over the enemy. And that as we submit our lives to God, he gives us the strength to overcome any temptation that Satan would bring against us. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded and he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident, and when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. 
So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan een mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook. Het leven is te kort om te verspillen. Trek jezelf uit de sleur. Word actief en maak er iets van. Ontdek de bestemming voor jouw leven en wat God voor jou in petto heeft. Joyce Meyer heeft hierover een boek geschreven. Ik daag je uit. Ontdek, ga de uitdaging aan en bestel het boek via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.